I'm just sort of expecting you at this point. I mean, sure. Why not? Come on in, take a seat. Let me talk to you about light novels for a bit, right? I'm just assuming that's why you're here. Why else would you be? Well, I guess since I have a captive audience and you keep coming back, no reason not to continue. So we're back here again, with probably the shortest video in this series. Not because I'm lazy. Well, maybe unrelated to my laziness is the better word choice here. But maybe it's more that we're tackling the shortest book in this franchise to date. Volume 6 is sort of the red-headed stepchild of the body of work. Because even though it's the shortest book from the English volume so far, it's also arguably the one with the least amount of content. I'm also aware that shortly before I released my last video boldly declaring that this is what Season 2 would contain, Season 2 of the anime was... actually announced. It's almost like I'm doing these to be topical, or maybe even jump a little bit ahead of the curve. I don't have that kind of faith in me though, so let's just say it's not a coincidence. And hey, an adaptation to Volume 6 is only going to be an episode or two at best. That's how little this contains. Well, no sense stalling it. Let's get into it by discussing the plot of this one. So where we last left off, Tanya was quite pissed off over the fact that snow was falling in the Federation, meaning winter was upon them quite a bit earlier than they hoped. And Zetor had publicly announced the formation of the Council for Self-Governance among the occupied territory in the Federation. It's uh, now November, and a good chunk of the beginning of this novel is looking at the repercussions of that. Beginning with the titular protagonist herself, Tanya, getting a load of supplies dropped off, but much to her chagrin, the cold weather gear that they were promised is winter clothes for the homeland, not the Federation. This is uh, foreshadowing right there. Not the clothing per se, but the stupidity of sending slightly thicker cotton clothes to people trekking through literal feet of snow in sub-freezing temperatures. So, the clothes suck, but they have enough ammo despite the fact that they're not doing much fighting. Because, uh, it's the middle of winter, and the lines have solidified for the most part. Though, Tanya's work isn't done, and she's been busy putting in requests for... socks of all things. While talking about getting proper clothes for the temperatures, Tanya and Visha debate what's worse. The metaphor of General Winter with the ice and cold making fighting impossible, or the newly invented General Mud, which happens when the snow melts and all the dirt in the Federation turns their metaphorical quagmire into a literal one. After a bit of debate, Tanya tells her to write up a report and submit it to the general staff because she's now worried that the group running the war are all thinking the same thing, so there's no dissenting voice to offer opposing views for debate and thus spurring creativity. The situation isn't any better when they realize that their tanks are barely operating at half capability due to the uh, lack of antifreeze. Oh, and their guns are freezing too because the Empire over-engineered the stupid things, so they can't really be fixed easily. Her plan for all of that? Steal from the Federation because their crap actually works in the cold. I guess the major question there is how is she going to justify all that without it being a crime? And uh, don't worry, the answer's about as stupid as you'd think. Since the Federation are communist, everything is technically state property, so therefore they can steal whatever. That's uh, not accurate. But Tanya's motto is that laws are a cudgel to bludgeon her opponents with, not something to restrict herself. So she twists definitions to the point where they work in her favor, and leaves it for legal to debate later. On a minor note, Loria has gathered quite a bit of intel and is already planning his next move. Over to Drake. He meets up with Mikkel and the two have a real bonding moment about how Drake saved Mikkel's ass twice. Once from dying, and once from his government with some praise. But despite them both speaking English, they have to keep it under wraps due to the political situation around them, especially with how much attention that would bring. A little later on, they get some orders to launch a reconnaissance and force mission, which is what Loria wanted, where they're uh, basically announcing the multinational unit to the Empire, while gauging how much of a fight both the Empire and Council can put up. They're using this info to see how well a counteroffensive in the spring will go. In the meantime, Tiny gets notified that some mages pushed into her turf, so she mobilizes herself and the battalion to go help out the village that's under attack that's also part of the Council. The reason being not that she wants to protect the village, but if they don't make a show of helping, it'll undermine the council's faith in them. She gets up in the air, Weiss is already there helping out, and it turns out the village was already plenty fortified so the multinational unit can't punch through. Tanya flares up her mana signal to try and scare the enemy off, but they're not leaving empty handed, and issue a warning to the village. Surrender to the commonwealth specifically, and no harm will come to them. The people in the village ultimately accept, and the conflict is resolved pretty 
anticlimactically, to say the least. Mary was there too, uh, watching in the rear, but for once actually understood she needed to not go in head first because Tanya's too strong for her. So she vows to get her revenge, eventually, and the result of that pointless mission was Loria now knows that the council is serious. The message of ethnic self-determination is spreading, which is, uh, bad news for the Communist Party. But I know what you're thinking. That all seemed too easy. Tanya scared them off just by announcing herself, the Federation learned what they wanted, and the Commonwealth freed some random citizens from living on a war front. So wins all around. But Mary was involved and she didn't fuck something up? How is that possible? Oh, she told her bestest friend Tanenshka that she could take the prisoners they just captured. Because, uh, they're Federation citizens and Mary thinks they'll be put to death because she's horribly inept at reading between the lines. Yeah, that sounds about right. So Drake and Mikhail have to have a big blowout argument for a show in front of Tanenshka, while using her as a translator, in order to get the prisoners back to the Commonwealth. Yeah. Drake's plan is to essentially rescue these people. They're gonna go back as prisoners in air quotes, but most likely either A, be deprogrammed, or B, pumped for any information that they have on either the Empire or the Federation. In a sort of win them over with cigars and alcohol sort of thing. Mary being a massive fuck up in every situation she's involved in while also being a petulant child crying because she's not getting her way is basically her character from this point onward. I really hope you don't have high expectations for her. She will fail to meet them. Meanwhile, a certain country decided to stop sitting on the sidelines and actually get involved in the war. No, not the United States, but the Kingdom of Ildoa. They've, uh, been in the story to this point, in passing mention. I never really felt the need to talk about them because all they ever did was offer up some ports in the end of Book 3. They hadn't had any named characters and, well, this is their main story achievement to this point, so let's talk about them. This is the one country that has friendly relations with the Empire, though their official stance is neutral. However, despite being friendly with the Empire, it's not simply because they like or sympathize with them. Ildoa is this world's Italy, and the Empire has some territory that's ethnically Ildoan, but under their control, and the government of Ildoa would like to see that returned. They also understand that they're absolutely no match for the Empire in terms of military strength, so they thought they'd be somewhat friendly and put themselves in a better position. So let's get introduced to the two key players. General, god I wish I was making this up, Gasman, the uh, head of the kingdom's army. He's an intelligence man with the mind of a politician who's seen combat, so he understands war and how to make it benefit his country. His direct subordinate, Colonel Calandro, who's actually an intelligence officer. Their goal is to facilitate peace between the two sides. The United Front of the Federation, Commonwealth, and neutral in name only, Unified States, as well as the Solo Fighting Empire. The reason why? It would make their country look good. Oh, and they're planning to strike a deal with the Empire to get the land back that they want. But in order to get the Empire ready for peace, they have to first scare them with the distinct possibility of a three-pronged war. So they launch some combat exercises on the border with the Empire and give them due notice. That sends the general staff into full-on panic mode, because they're worried the kingdom is about to declare war. With some intel saying they're about to mobilize 25 divisions, that's enough to make the Eastern Front hell if it does turn out that way, so they do have reason to worry. They scrape together 18 divisions and send Lurgan over to that border to meet with the kingdom, all under the pretense that they're observing their exercises. And, uh can gauge what's actually happening. Because despite the mobilized army, the supply chain hasn't changed internally, and their navy isn't making any moves. Meaning, uh, it most likely isn't war. Tanya gets orders that she's been reassigned to Central, so she and her troops pack up once again. Lucky her. Lurgan meets Calandro, and the two talk candidly, which really throws Lurgan off, since this is potentially a hostile nation. However, Calandro pretty much outwits Lurgan at every turn, jumping the gun to admit that he's there under Gaspin's order as a spy, basically, and that they're willing to be peace negotiators for the war if the Empire's interested. By the way, uh, this is not how peace negotiations work. The army doesn't negotiate peace or even set this stuff up. That's for the Foreign Affairs Office to do. So Lurgan, being a mere colonel on top of all that information, is well beyond his authority. But Ildoa approaches the army for a reason, because they may actually listen. 
So with the exercises being a mere excuse to talk to the army, it comes down to Ildo wants that chunk of land back, which the Empire refuses outright. But you know, a deal could be made if the Empire gets a stronger commitment from their supposed ally, and in the meantime they can begin the process of peace negotiations with the other countries. However, due to their nature as being neutral, direct supplies would put them in a precarious situation, as selling oil would make the other countries declare war. To counter that point, Lurgan's picked up quite a bit from Tanya, and understands that laws are meant to be bent to your advantage. Essentially, they'll take oil for civilian use. They'll be sure to not use it for war. And while that's going down, the Commonwealth is shitting a brick about this meeting, but it's made clear the kingdom isn't a strong country so their entry into the war isn't realistic. Aside from that, the Federation wants to open up another front, and that would take some pressure off the east. So a plan is hatched where the Commonwealth will bombard the west to pull some troops off the east, while the Federation sneaks the multinational unit into the former alliance to meet up with insurgency groups. That way they can supply them and that'll pull even more troops off their back. Convoluted as hell, right? So Tanya and her conf group command are all talking at a cafe in the capital, Essentially, they're discussing how shit everything is, how far the newer members of Tanya's group have come, and how awesome it is that Ildo is sending some coffee. Like, real coffee. Hell yeah. Later that night, Tanya meets up with Uger while having Weiss escort her. The two talk about the current situation because something's been bugging Tanya for a while now. The war situation isn't improving, and if things keep up, the Empire will run out of steam soon, as they're already on their last leg from a manpower and resource standpoint and Tanya makes the bold claim that they should pursue peace with the Federation if the chance arises, because otherwise the Empire will start losing, and everything they fought for to this point will be lost. So, best to cut their losses now, so to speak, even if that means essentially resetting to pre-war borders. So no annexations, and zero reparations. But Uger dismisses that out of hand, because what about those who have already sacrificed? The lives lost, the citizens who gave up items, food, and freedom? All for the war effort? And all of that? Yeah, that's the sunk cost fallacy. The view of the army, citizens, and government is that this war couldn't have been for nothing, so resetting to before it would be worse than a waste. It's tantamount to surrender. And uh, who the hell surrenders when they're winning? That's a good question right there. You didn't think of that now did you, Tanya? Uger tells Tanya the citizens have sacrificed too much and their own media agrees so they're expecting blood and major compensation for this war. Why is that? Because the government and army didn't censor the media. Or, you know, run proper propaganda? Hell, they didn't even have a plan for it in the first place. And, uh, just to be clear, uh, who kicked off that wave of patriotism again? Probably that little video passed around about a certain mage battalion bombing the enemy capital stoked its fair share of fire. We catch my drift. So Tanya, absently wondering why the Empire can't get its shit together and keeps putting things off like supplies, propaganda, and strategy, to which Hooker regretfully tells her, the general staff never envisioned embarking on a foreign campaign, you know, as their army was designed around interior defense. So we learn that the army's been copying notes from, get this, a Republican Army General Staff's research paper on invading the Empire. We learn that Zetor's the sole person who's been coming up with these off-the-cuff plans and last-minute pushes that's been keeping the whole situation from going south. I'm just gonna let that sink in. The Empire's grand plan for this war is no plan. Zero plan. They don't have one. They are planant. They have no exit strategy. And even what their end goal is or how they're planning to achieve it is being created on the fly by one general after he read a research paper by an enemy about invading his own country. There's no win condition here besides keep winning until their army is no more. That's not a good strategy, especially against the Federation who's completely comfortable throwing every man, woman, and child in front of the Empire and their government so that they don't get taken over. Do you see why this situation is ass? Anyway, Mary and her unit get sent up to the Alliance via submarine to deliver supplies and assist the rebelling populace where they can. Unlike in the Federation, these people are engaged in civil disobedience and planned strikes outside of towns to keep the Empire busy and annoyed, rather than outright fighting them. The reason being that lessens the risk on civilian lives, while also tying up Empire resources. The people fighting here are the elderly who are former Alliance military, and Mary's super stoked to meet them all. 
It's treated as a big return home, and there's photo ops and everything for her in the multinational unit. But it's quickly revealed that the Resistance wants nothing to do with the military because they'll draw too much attention, so they basically want them all to piss off. Mary, displeased with this, throws a tantrum, which requires Drake to scold her like a dad, which is just laughably bad for a soldier. I'm sorry, we're supposed to take her seriously? But they do stick around for a while. And Tanya shipped up north to deal with the increase in resistance activity in the area, partially because of Mary's unit, but they never directly come into conflict. However, she finds that the insurgents strike way too quickly, or are way too small a scale for her units to be effective. So, uh, she's just getting a massive headache up there. This just strikes home how shit the Empire is at invading. Since, yeah, they're beating an army, but they're left with a ton of pissed off civilians causing trouble wherever they go. But she's not there for too long, because she gets noticed that the Federation is gearing up for a spring offensive. Who'd have seen that coming? Meanwhile, Zetor and Rudersdorf are debating what to do with the war situation to keep the Unified States from joining, while also talking about Ildoa's proposal. But they do have a plan for terms, ones that would get them everything they want. And honestly, they don't need reparations, just a secured promise for peace, by having buffer states between them and the Federation on the East. So there's their terms, and our book. Let me be a bit candid here for a moment. While this is probably my least favorite book in the franchise due to its lack of content, it does have two things going for it. First, it's got probably the best cover, I love this thing. And second, it has a bomb reveal that the general staff is incompetent, which shakes Tanya to her core. That's some good shit right there, but that's pretty much it. I told you in the beginning there wasn't a ton to cover in terms of plot. I still skipped over a ton of unimportant banter while condensing the events into a more digestible format. And I still feel like I talked about this at length. And that's why this feels like a 300 page middle child that has nothing to say, but sets up the conclusion for the next volume. But let's focus on what it did accomplish. You know, I can't even really begin to dissect how much shit is falling apart in this one. Not organically even. It's not like the situation has become so complex it's having trouble staying together, but more the author didn't have any ideas on what to do to raise the stakes. So he made the Empire a bunch of idiots held together by one man who can think on his feet. Eh, I mean, that's not entirely fair. They're a nation threatened on all sides who specialized in defense, so I suppose that does lend to this situation. But it just feels like this is only being brought up now, when the series has gone on for a bit too long for the initial premise to wear thin. The Empire's already won against two foes in the North and West, where logistics were their biggest problem. And while the Empire admitted it was out of its depth when advancing, they could still plan to do so. It makes me question why the Empire's strategies in the North and West worked, but suddenly they're struggling to maintain control. The issue of insurgency didn't come up until the Eastern Theater opened. What about the former Republic? Their army vacated and declared independence. But is their government back home still running the show and just a puppet of the Empire? Because we hear nothing about those citizens giving the Empire a hard time. Hell, the former Alliance wasn't until this volume. These are questions that are raised. The incompetence here is mostly just a narrative excuse for why the fighting continues. And this is also why I say the writer handled it poorly. Because to this point, the Empire was successful on a strategic level, even if they disagreed about what strategy to pursue. But suddenly they can't come up with any long-term strategy or a way to end the war? It stretches my suspension to disbelief at this point, and really just allows the story an excuse to keep going. If the last volume was about Tanya's incompetence with her making mistakes that came back to bite her, then this volume's about the General Staff's incompetence putting the entire war at risk, with grave consequences for Tanya. Which means Volume 7 will be about the Imperial government's incompetence to form a satisfying trilogy of bad decisions. And from a narrative standpoint, that does make a satisfying throughline, I guess. But it does sacrifice one of the key aspects of the Empire to do so. I mean, their diversity of opinions and welcoming of debate was something lauded a few books ago. And now we're told that's basically a farce. And this whole time it's been Zetor making it up on the fly? Though I will admit, that's a hell of a reveal for Tanya to discover that the grand plan she thought she was following doesn't even exist, all while validating her fears that the general staff was making poor decisions while not listening to their soldiers on the front lines. Another main point of my contention here is with Mary. Just her entire character to this point. 
everything with Mary in the multinational unit is utterly pointless to this story while managing to butcher her personality for no real reason. So Mary is the yin to Tanya's yang, and I get that. That's how this is presented, where Tanya is a cold, calculating pragmatist who prioritizes her own survival above all else. Mary is a compassionate, naive idealist who throws herself into danger with no forethought. If Tanya is meant to be loathed, Mary is meant to be loved. They're the two sides of this war personified, where the Empire's raw logic meets the pure emotion of the rest of the world, preventing their domination. And while this lacks the divine purpose in the anime by literally endowing her with the power to fight Tanya from being X, this still has narrative juxtaposition, as the two are child soldiers fighting on opposite sides for different reasons. So what's a great way to make that character endear to the audience? Probably not by making her constantly whine about pointless things. Mary's entire string of events in this book was annoyed she didn't get frontline action against Tanya when the multinational unit was doing recon in force, complaining to Drake that he was sentencing those captured in said recon to death in the Commonwealth, despite him knowing that they'd be fine and treated as defectors. In fact, him taking them prisoner was him trying to help them out, and then her complaining in the Alliance because she couldn't read the room, and then getting pissed off no one wanted to start a full-on uprising, with their lack of manpower, resources, and space to fight said war outside of major cities. All of these are things that she should be able to pick up on, or at least understand. Hell, at the very least, she shouldn't be making a scene in front of other armies to her commanding officer, all because she's not getting her way. I mean, seriously, this is the character we're supposed to root for? I'm not buying it. In fact, her behavior in this volume pretty much cements her as just a mere annoyance, while Drake is the better practical foil to Tanya. It's just too bad that the story puts so much weight on Mary since she's been in it since volume 2. The two things the multinational unit accomplished in this volume do not impact the greater story and have no relevance in the coming volumes. The recon in force made zero difference on the front, because the information they unwittingly gathered was stuff Loria was already fairly certain of. Then their excursion up to the former alliance to try and pull some troops away from the eastern front is entirely a waste, mostly because the alliance resistance didn't want them there and their hit-and-run tactics tied up a single conf group. And that's only made further pointless by the fact that they're on the Eastern Front again as soon as this volume's over. So please, tell me, what was the point of their inclusion in this book? You know, again, we're at the point where the author can't decide where Tanya should be or what she should be doing. This is the second volume where she's gone up to the Alliance for no real reason other than to fight a pointless battle. Why? But this one was even more pointless, because she didn't even lose or gain anything in the process. I guess besides reaffirming her belief that the Empire shouldn't be annexing territory since they're already stretched this thin. The climax of this book is just non-existent. There's no real changes or revelations that drastically shift the dynamic, leading smoothly into the next. Hell, real quick, I'm just gonna run through what the beats in this book were. The multinational unit attacks, Tanya meets with Uger where she learns that the Empire's inept before heading up north for no reason, Lurgan does unofficial peace talks with Ildola. And that's it. That's the book. Not a single one of those things goes anywhere. Learning the general staff is actually incompetent doesn't change the situation, as they're still hashing out last minute plans that are working. But the main point of this volume is probably the most underwhelming aspect. It's the possible path of peace laid out by Ildoa. Those negotiations and seeing the Empire through a somewhat amiable foreign lens illuminates how the smaller or weaker countries see their rise to power, how even those smaller countries can play key roles. That whole situation is incredibly more engaging, as we're getting strong, character-laced depictions of actual backroom political dealings that have reaching consequences. That's the setup for the next book, and honestly, makes me wonder why Tanya was sent up north to not bump into Mary when she should have been sent down to participate in the impromptu joint military exercise with Ildoa, while working with Lurgan to leverage the Empire's interests. That wouldn't have been more interesting and had her engage with the plot? Come on. So instead, she's not so involved with the story happening here, which I suppose does lend to the narrative that Tanya is sort of at the whims of fate. But I do have to argue that the choice to have her there only makes more sense in the greater scheme of things. It shows that her efforts are futile in the face of destiny. That this greater power, being X, will work the world against her, despite whatever plans she hatches. 
At least then it could have ended on her thinking that if the general staff can't end the war, she could. I swear, I don't mean to come off on these books as hard as I do, because I'm sure people see my criticisms of them and think, God, he had to have hated these. But no, I liked this franchise a lot. The core premise is solid, the characters almost work, they're just a bit weak, but mostly, I feel the plot could have just been handled better. To this point, it severely needed an editorial influence to get the author's ideas more honed, because after book 5, it just sort of drags, and all the conflicts in the East just blend together. Hell, while writing this script, I had to skim the book, because I kept forgetting whatever pitiful excuses for plot beats this volume had. Next time we wrap up this arc, where the general staff puts together one last offensive to end the war. But for now, hey, made it to the end of the video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and do all the other YouTube stuff to help the channel grow. You can also join my Discord with the link down in the description. And if you really want to support me, you can head on over to my Patreon where you can pick up some extra perks, like voting on what I do next. And speaking of Patreon, I'd like to give a special thanks to Nadeshko for their continued support. Thanks for watching.